Good morning and uh, thank you both for joining class. We'll, uh, we'll begin, then the others can uh, join in. So let's just pray. Can uh, Kanan, can you lead us in pray, prayer, please? be possible for you to lead us in prayer can you hear me ma'am yes i can okay uh, let's pray oh the lord thank you for this wonderful day and oh lord lord um uh, and thank you for this wonderful day lord lord uh, uh thank you for the subject lord Lord, give us some more uh good things uh, uh the things that we learn from your word lord lord uh help everyone to join on on time lord the there are no connectivity issues or uh, network issues, Lord. Lord, uh, from the end to the uh, from the starting to the end, your uh, you help you give your help, Lord, to uh, understand everything, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So last week we were looking at uh, Titus chapter two, where. The, uh, Paul is instructing the church at Crete and Titus and, uh, you know, uh, he's giving instructions for older men and women in the church. And uh, he goes on also to talk about uh, in verses 4 to 8, uh, he gives instructions for the younger women and men in the church. And then he gives instructions for born servants or slaves in the church. We uh, see this in Titus chapter 2, verses uh, 9 to 10. Uh, and then he ends this whole uh, chapter by giving us an eschatological hope, uh, which is a hope for all men in verses 11 to uh, 14. Uh, and he's uh, talking there. He mentions three ways that grace trains us. Uh, he says grace trains us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Uh, grace trains us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And then he says that grace trains us to live in godliness uh, by looking ahead, that is looking at the head, is looking ahead of the coming of uh, Jesus Christ, his second coming, and behind, which is looking at the cross, at what Jesus has accomplished on the cross uh, for us. And then we look at the summary, um, uh, verse 15, where his, uh, we, we, we stopped here. He says, speak these things, uh, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. And so this is a summary of Titus chapter 2. Uh, and this is given to us in verse 15. Uh, so, you know, Paul is indicating that um, uh, different approaches are needed with different people. Uh, for some of them, we need to exhort them. Some of them, we need to, uh, you know, uh, rebuke them with all authority. And so he says, uh, you know, just a word uh, is for some people, you just tell them uh, one or two words or sentences. They're all that is needed to get them back on the right track or the right path. But for others, you need to give them strong exhortation. Uh, for some, they need uh, convincing proofs or they need to be convicted that they are wrong and then they will, uh, you know, uh, come back to the right path. So it says different people are different and so we need to approach uh, different ones uh, differently. And so he says exhort, um, the Greek word exhort is parakelio, uh, which means to press with earnestness. That means uh, a leader or a minister of God, uh, when he is, uh, you know, sharing godly doctrines, uh, um, he, uh, he should not do it as if they are simple things, but he must uh, urge them with earnestness and importance. Uh, and he must call all of them who are hearing him or who he's preaching to and teaching that they not only be hearers of the word, but also be doers of the word so that they may be blessed. Okay, so that is what is the meaning of the word exhort. Um, 
And, uh, you know, uh, if you look at this Greek word for exhort is parakelio, uh, which is also a word that is related uh, to the word used for the Holy Spirit. The word for Holy Spirit is parakletos. Uh, parakletos means somebody who comes alongside us and aids us and helps us. Okay. Uh, somebody who comes alongside for assistance. Uh, so he, the, the thought here is in exhorting people is you come alongside them, uh, uh, so come alongside somebody who's doing wrong to assist them and help them uh, to know what they're doing is wrong and to help them to do what is right and to act upon the truth. So that is what he says is exhortation. He says for some people you have to exhort, for some people you have to rebuke um, Rebuke me relates to communicating uh, with one who knows the truth and is acting against the truth. So somebody who knows the truth is acting against the truth, then you need to rebuke them in an attempt to bring them back to help them to uh, realize their position where they are, that they are in the wrong position, that they need to change their position. So you need to rebuke them. It also relates to conviction. Uh, which means you need to convict them uh, with words. And then Paul is saying, you know, do all this with authority. Um, you know, Paul has all the authority in the church uh, at that time, but he extends his authority to Titus. Um, and he's saying, Titus, use every bit of that authority. And then he ends this chapter by saying, let no one despise you, okay? Uh, or let no one disregard you. Uh, which means he's telling Titus, just like he said, Timothy, you know, uh, don't let anyone disregard you, but be an example in life, in conduct, and in speech. That's, uh, as he says, tells Timothy, he's telling Titus, be an example of godliness and good deeds, which, is, uh, which he mentions in verses 7 to 8, uh, so that people, when they hear your message, when they hear you teaching, um, they will know that, uh, you know, your actions, your life, your very life, your action uh, backs it all up. And so that is how he ends uh, chapter 2. Okay, so we, we couldn't finish verse 15 uh, last Wednesday. So we just looked at uh, verse 15 now. Okay, any questions on or any doubts you have on chapter 2? Questions, doubts on chapter two? If not, we'll move on to chapter three. Uh, how many of you would like to read chapter three this morning? Anyone would like to read chapter three? A few verses? No one wants to, okay, uh, Kanan, anyone else? Okay, Kanan, there are 15 verses, so maybe you can read the first eight and I will read the rest. Seven of them. So you can read the first uh, okay. eight verses of chapter three. Hmm. <coughs> Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all hum humility to all men. For we ourselves, we are also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and uh, envy, hateful and hating one another, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of re regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out uh, on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been Justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the 
hope of eternal life. Thank you. Uh, verse 8, this is a faithful say saying and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is uh, was, uh, wrapped and singing and sinning, uh, being self-contemned. Then I send Artemis to you and Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Praise be with you all. Amen. Okay, so let's look at um, uh, chapter three. Let's study chapter three in a little more detail. Uh, we just finished looking at chapter two. And even as Paul ends it, uh, you know, uh, he says, let no one despise you, uh, you know, but set an example in godliness and good deeds. Uh, it's something that uh, we also need to uh, can uh, receive for our lives as well, because most of you all are young. You know, uh, and as young people, when we happen to be teaching and preaching in church, uh, you know, uh, people will uh, not receive our message if they do not, uh, uh, if our works, if our lives, uh, if our character does not portray godliness, if it does not show forth uh, a godly lifestyle, they will not accept um, uh, or receive uh, what we are preaching or what we are teaching them. So it's very important that um, we all grow in Christ-likeness, uh, in maturity, in Christ-likeness. And then when we release the spiritual things, you know, people will receive it. If not, uh, they will not receive it. Okay. So that is very important. It's not the, our preaching skills, our styles, the doctrines, the words we use, but it's our own lives that people see and read because our lives are an open book and people see our, uh, our lives and, uh, you know, it's very important to maintain uh, uh, a godly lifestyle, a godly living, godly mannerisms that are Christ-like so that people can um, receive our message or receive our leadership or receive what we are uh, telling them and we can be able to minister to them as well, okay? So here in uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 2, Paul is writing to the church at Crete and he's telling them to respect um, authority, okay? Um uh, now, why is he telling the Cretan people that they need to respect authority? Um, because, you know, if you look at the background of the Cretan people, uh, we will understand why Paul is uh, writing to them and telling them to respect authority. Because uh, commentators, commentary writers have said that Cretans were uh, notoriously turbulent and quarrelsome people who were, who were impatient with all authority. That means they were turbulent means uh, and quarrelsome means they used to fight among themselves in their own country, not fighting with other nations, other people, but, uh, you know, fighting within their people in their own country, people with their own people groups, people with different religious uh, backgrounds. Uh, they were very quarrelsome people and also they were very impatient with uh, all authority. And so uh, P uh, Paul is writing here uh, and asking them to be subject to rulers and authorities. The other reason also here is that, you know, um, the Jewish believers, those Jews who became believers, you know, they were also rebelling against uh, government, civil authority, uh, government uh, leaders and rulers. And they used to say that there is, for a believer, uh, you know, um, uh, 
uh, that no believer in the true God had any responsibility to civil government and its laws because they said that these things were purely human. So he says, you know, you shouldn't be adhering to uh, human uh, government, civil laws and, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming under the authority of uh, civil government because uh, uh, these are purely human. Uh, so if you're a believer, then you're putting your faith in the true and living God, then you need to only be subject to God's laws, rules, his authority. But here Paul is reminding the Cretan people that they, uh, you know, as part of our witness, uh, it requires us to be subject to rulers and those in authority. You know, sometimes even we will find it very difficult to, uh, you know, pay our taxes or, uh, uh, you know, come under laws and rules of the government, of the, those in authority, uh, also to respect some of our leaders because uh, uh, those in civil authority because of their lifestyle, the way they're doing things. We can see there's so much of uh, misappropriation of funds and the way they are living. But, you know, the word of God teaches us that we need to be subject to civil government government, to civil authorities, those in leadership positions in the government. And we also need to uh, respect the rules and laws of the land. We need to come under it. And we need to do everything to live peacefully with our neighbors, with people of different religions, also peacefully uh, with the uh, government rules uh, and their uh, rules and their authority. Okay. So he says, that is part of our witness. So one of our witness is not just preaching and teaching, but our witness is also in how we respect authorities and uh, the rules and the, uh, the laws that govern the uh, land. And he says, we must obey the laws of our society. Uh, but if those laws, you know, are against God's standards, his standards of righteousness, holiness, uh, and it requires us to disobey the law of God, then we need to choose to obey God's laws rather than man-made rules and laws. Okay, And then he says, be ready for every good work. So apart from being obedient to government authorities, he's saying that believers ought to take an active role or an active part in engaging in good deeds, in good activities that promote uh, welfare of the community. So, you know, do things that will help in, uh, in welfare of the community, um, you know, whether it is uh, uh, helping people in your street, your area, uh, whether it is standing up for something that's wrong that is happening or uh, wanting something to be good roads or uh, street lights or whatever to be put up in your sun, you stand along with other people um, uh, and uh, do good, uh, which will help in uh, promoting the welfare of the community. Then he says, um, you know, speak evil of no one, be peaceable, gentle, showing uh, all humility to all men. So he's talking here about how Christians need to act towards uh, outsiders, towards everyone. We need to be good and pleasing in every way. Uh, and especially mentioning this to the Cretans because uh, they are people who are troublesome, turbulent, quarrelsome, fighting. Uh, you know, so he says, stop. Um, or refrain from attacking people by words uh, or by deed. Uh, you know, uh, be considerate to others, uh, have an yielding spirit towards everyone. So if somebody has wronged you, uh, you know, he says you need to try to, uh, you know, resolve the differences uh, and make peace, not fight, uh, not engage in, um, uh, in, in being quarrelsome, uh, attacking each other, fighting with each other with words or with fists or with your hands. Uh, and he says it's more important for us to maintain good relationships with our neighbors than stand for our right sometimes we know our neighbors can do things uh, that are not right yes we need to speak about it um, but you know uh, when it's very very important it is something that is uh, uh, is very important and we stand up for our rights but we say it and do it in a very peaceful way uh, but sometimes we you know uh, we can uh, if it's not very important uh, something that is very insignificant then we can just let it go uh, 
so that you know we can just have peace with our neighbors we can be in love with them uh maintain a love relationship rather than you know angering them uh or saying things that will hurt them uh, just for little things that uh, you know uh, uh can be looked overlooked which is not really kind of disturbing or bothering us you know uh, we needn't have to stand up for our rights at that time we can just let it go uh, so that we can maintain uh, good relationships uh, with our neighbor okay uh, so he's talking about this in the context of for the cretans uh, who are constantly fighting with each other but also applies to us even as we live in a neighborhood even if as we uh, work in a um, uh, you know a different uh, places we mingle with people uh, you know we just think and some sometimes just give up our rights uh, just to maintain good relationship with uh, our neighbor we're not just talking about neighbors who live beside us neighbor can be even people who are working in our workplaces or also people who are, you know who are traveling around with us just give up our uh, rights sometimes uh, to maintain good relationships so that we can show forth our witness that we uh, are believers of Christ then he says talks about humility here do it all in humility uh, humility means uh, meekness be meek okay but some people think humility means uh, uh, weakness showing forth your weakness it does not mean weakness but it's rather um, you know strength under control that means you're somebody who's a strong personality who has uh, knows what is right and wrong can even talk for your rights um, but you are somebody who's learning to control exercise control to know when to say what in what circumstances when to give up your rights when to stand up for your rights so you have that kind of control uh, so he's saying here that in our dealings with outsiders we should be under the control of the holy spirit uh, you know responding graciously and even kindly even when people wrong us even when people do things that are hurting you know uh, people even when people uh, you know are uh, being uh, partial or uh, uh, they're not being right you know we know that we are being wronged and we get, can get angry uh, but at that time we need to respond graciously and kindly uh, because uh, we are under the influence or under the control of the holy spirit and then paul goes on to mention uh, what should inspire us to behave in this way he says that we ourselves uh, you know in our own nature we were bad you know or we were really a uh, sinful people we were living evil wicked lives before we became uh, believers and how did god treat us did he treat us uh, you know tit for tat did he treat us the way that we deserved no he treated us kindly he treated us lovingly he was gentle patient with us uh, and he saved us even though we did not deserve it okay so when we have received uh, the kindness the mercy the grace and the love of god then how much more we need to be kind gracious compassionate merciful and loving uh, to people of other faiths who are uh, you know under bondage of satan uh, who are living in their own sinful nature like we used to live one point of time and we used to be the same you know but now we are changed so we need to understand their situation understand who they are where they are where their situation and we need to show them the love of god and it's only the love of god that can uh, uh, change them okay i'll just give you a simple uh, example from my own life uh, you know once we were traveling uh, in a tourist bus that was uh, taking us uh, you know to a, a good tourist destination just a little away from bangalore a whole family was uh, going in that in in that the tourist bus dad mom and uh, three of my siblings so including me four of us uh, and we were the first ones to get into the bus so we you know got uh, seats next to each other and we were very happy comfortable and then as the bus uh, kept going in his journey kept picking up uh, uh, different people from different points in the city uh, even before it went to the destination uh, so they were mostly all of them were uh, young married couples who were recently married they were going for their honeymoon uh, but to, you know towards uh, when the bus was getting filled we realized that uh, you know there were just uh, about four seats that were uh, 
you know, or on the aisle side and all the window seats had been occupied, obviously, because people are uh, traveling, they want to look out, enjoy the beauty. Uh, so there were uh, about seat, seats, all single seats in the aisle row. And, uh, you know, these married couples, they wanted to sit next to each other. And uh, uh, so they started requesting the people who were sitting the window seats if, you know, if they could uh, move in front to the aisle seat because we are married, we want to sit together. And, uh, you know, they were not willing to move. And finally, it uh, ended up in a big argument. You know, uh, there were some, these couples were arguing with these uh, people who were traveling single, arguing with them, fighting with them. So finally, we decided that, uh, you know, just to uh, have peace and to enjoy because we're all going to be traveling the same bus, uh, have some peace. Let's, uh, let's take, occupy the single seat. So we said, okay, don't, uh, please don't fight. We will all occupy the single seats. Uh, you all can sit on the, uh, you know, you can take our seats. So we had to all move out and our family was all scattered and we were all sitting on the aisle rows in the single seats. And, uh, after everyone sat down, one of the couples, they asked us, are you all Christians? And we were shocked, you know, um, and uh, we, we said yes. And then we asked them, why did you say, why did you ask us that question? Says, you know, only Christians can do this. You know, only Christians, uh, you know, can show love to others. And we were really shocked because, uh, you know, we didn't think of this, but uh, look at how people are uh, reading our lives, seeing our lives. And, uh, and they're saying, you know, only Christians can do this. And we people, you know, we are very selfish people. Uh, we don't care for others. Uh, we see that Christians are caring. They're good. They they love others. And uh, we just quite kept quiet. But, you know, it kind of just impacted me so much that, uh, you know, little things that we do can create such an impact in the lives of others, can speak about our religion, can speak about our God. So, you know, we need to um, sometimes even put down our rights just to... Um, you know, uh, uh, so that, you know, our God can be glorified so that his love, his, his, his uh, compassion can uh, reach out to people. Any of you have any examples you'd like to share? Anything that you'd like to share? Okay, only four of you in the class. I hope you all are here. Yes, ma'am. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bad things happen when um, outsiders expect a lot when we do something. For example, uh, I know one boy uh, very close to me. So he say, I know one brother like you. Uh, he won't get angry at all. He is also Christian. I was working with him. So what the boy shared, he is working in a tailoring shop. Somebody has given the new dress. So when he uh, cutting the dress uh, to stitch the material, he cut wrongly. So entire piece went waste. But that owner is a Christian guy. He didn't scold anything. But uh, he comforted them and he bought a new dress for he himself and uh, stitched the new cloth for the customer. So he shocked. So Christians uh, sometimes show kindness in a beyond the measure. They won't get angry like you people, like that uh, the boy shared with me. Mm. Yeah, that's really something that's amazing for the for the owner of the shop not to shout at his, uh, you know, at the one who is working there because uh, he has to go and buy the dress material and stitch it again. I mean, that's really. Uh, the fruit of the spirit, that the Holy Spirit just manifesting in his life through self-control, goodness, love. Uh, I think that's only our, when we can do it, when we're abiding uh, in uh, the vine, abiding in God. And it's only the Holy Spirit that can uh, help us to live like that. Otherwise, it's just humanly not uh, really possible. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, thank you for sharing, Thomas. Let's move on. We look at the response to the Savior, uh, verses 3 to 8. So Paul is saying that, uh, you know, when Christ himself was showed, treated us kindly, graciously, mercifully, in love, even when he didn't deserve it, he died for us, then, you know, we need to also show it in our good deeds we need to also be kind gracious gentle patient with other people and so he goes on to talk about what should be our response to our savior in verses three to eight so in verse three he says for we ourselves are also once foolish disobedient deceived seeing various lusts and pleasures living in malice and envy hateful and a hating one another so uh, Paul in this verse is basically reminding us who we used to be. We used to be all of these things, a few of these things when we were living in our own sinful nature. And so the we here signifies believers or Christians. It says it's easy to become angry and impatient with believers who act selfish. But if we want to behave as godly people towards them, then we need to remember that before we met Christ, we acted in the same way that these people do. Uh, before we met Christ, we lived for our own selfish desires and pleasures. Uh, so it says, keeping in mind how we used to be will enable us to treat ungodly people with grace and compassion. And then he lists seven characters of unbelievers. Uh, first one, he says, we were once foolish. That means uh, we were without spiritual wisdom and understanding. We did not know God. And so our foolish hearts were darkened. Uh, uh, and then he says that the second characteristics, he says, is we are disobedient. We were disobedient to God, to his laws. We were disobedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The third characteristic, he says, is we are deceived. That means uh, we we had gone away from the truth. Uh, we, we, we wandered away from the right path, uh, all because of our ignorance, our unbelief, and because of our own lustful desires and pleasures. And hence, we were deceived. And then he says, the fourth characteristic is he's saying that serving various lusts and pleasures. Serving means he's talking about that we were uh, slaves. We used to be slaves of all kinds of lusts and pleasures. Um, and then the fifth characteristic, he says that we once spent our lives in malice. Now, malice is a general term for wickedness or for evil or every kind of evil. But here, the word malice is a desire to do harm to others. And desire to do harm for others uh, is from uh, you know sel un uh, from selfishness and wanting our own way, even if it means harming someone to get it. So he says, you Cretans, you know uh, you were living like this once before, but do not continue to live in malice. That means don't desire to do harm to people because uh, you, your, your ego has been hurt because it stems from your own selfishness. Uh, you want to have your own way and you end up uh, having it. Uh, uh, and in, 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 the, in the bargain, you end up hurting or harming someone because you want to have your own way or you want to, you know, what to do what you think is right or you want to have things that, uh, uh, things in your own way. The sixth characteristic, he says, is we uh, once spent our lives in envy. Uh, envy is when we are not pleased, when we see others happy and prosperous, uh, and you want some what someone else has, or you desire the position that they are in. Uh, so he says that we used to live like that. We were living as envious people. And also the last characteristic he mentioned is that we were living in hatred. But in verse 4, he says, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, uh, toward men appeared. Okay, so the but here reminds us of who we were as sinners, uh, that, you know, there was nothing good in us, nothing deserving of us to receive salvation. Uh, all we deserved is the wrath and the judgment of God. But God, because of his great kindness, love and mercy, he saved us. And uh, this verse gives us the basis or the cause of our salvation. What is the basis or the cause of our salvation? God's kindness 
his love and his mercy so the kindness of god our savior and his love for mankind appeared when jesus christ uh, who is the eternal god took on human flesh entered our world he died in our place for our sins and we personally experience his mercy his compassion in our very pitiable stage when we were slaves to sin slaves to the devil uh, but when uh, god showed his compassion his merciful mercy his love uh, we were saved okay and in verse 5 he says not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the holy spirit now this verse gives us the effects of our salvation the previous verse uh, uh, we see that um, he talks about you know what is the basis or what is the cause of salvation in verse 4 and in verse 5 he is talking about the effects of our salvation so what is the effects of our salvation here in this verse mentioned in verse 5 what is the effects of salvation mentioned here in verse 5 he mentions regeneration and renewal and in verse 7 he mentions justification okay so paul uh, so paul uh, is giving us the means of our salvation also here he is giving us the effects of salvation what are the effects of salvation regeneration and renewal verse 7 he talks about justification and he also gives us the means of our salvation what is the means of our salvation the means of our salvation is to the power of the holy spirit that is in work uh, uh the power of the holy spirit through the work of jesus christ so here he mentions two things one is the effects of our salvation which is regeneration renewal and justification and he also gives us the means of our salvation how do we receive it it is through the power of the holy spirit through the work of jesus Christ so the work of Jesus Christ and by the power of the holy spirit so paul states here that we are not saved as a result of the works of our own righteousness uh, by our own good deeds or acts none of our good deeds or none of our acts can make us right in god's sight but uh he says we are saved because of uh, god's mercy his kindness and his grace now what does it mean by washing of regeneration what does it mean by this term washing of regeneration now many commentators interpret this washing of regeneration uh, uh or commentary writers they say it is referring to baptism uh but uh, you know many say it's not uh, this is not baptism Uh, though it's talking about washing of regeneration this is not baptism because in the new testament baptism happens after we are born again after our new birth so baptism is a testimony of what god did in saving us in that in us receiving uh you know our new birth or we are made new creations and uh, uh baptism is uh, a, a a testimony or a, a symbolic thing that we are washed from all our sins but the greek word that's used here for the word washing is lutheron and uh, it's only mentioned here and it's mentioned in ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 so uh, it means uh, uh, a vessel for bathing okay it means a vessel that is used for uh, taking a bath it's used as a vessel used for bathing so in titus chapter 3 verse 5 paul uh you know who knows the old testament very well must be thinking of ezekiel chapter 16 verse 4 where god speaks metaphorically of israel's birth as a nation and then in ezekiel chapter 16 verses 4 6 and verse 9 uh we read that in verse 4 he says as for your birth on the day you were born your navel cord was not cut 
you were not washed with water for cleansing, you were not rubbed with salt or even uh, wrapped with clothes. So uh, God is talking about uh, how uh, Israelite as a nation was, uh, you know, given birth to. Uh, their birth was one which, you know, nobody cared for them when they were uh, born. Nobody cut off their navel cord, nobody washed them with the of the blood and the water and everything that was there. Nobody cleaned them up. Nobody rubbed salt. You know, salt is for cleansing, purification. And nobody put, uh, you know, clothes around them. Uh, you know, all that we see uh, parents or midwives or nurses do for uh, babies when they are born. And God says, uh, he, uh, you know, I took pity on you because you were left as nation, as a nation, nobody cared for you. Nobody bothered about you. You know, um, he says, um, nobody took pity on you, and you were just thrown in a field and left to die. That's what he he says. And then God says in uh, chapter sixteen, uh, verse six of Ezekiel, uh, it says that God passed by and saw her squirming in her blood. So you know, it was like God saw the nation of Israel struggling, crying out. Uh, you know, for their life, for their very existence. And uh, God saw their pitiable state and he said, live. And later in verse 9 of the same chapter of Ezekiel chapter 16, he tells uh, them how he, he himself bathes them with water, washes off their blood. And it's a picture of how, you know, uh, also it's a picture of what God did for the nation of Israel um, and how he brought them to the promised land, the state they were in as slaves, but how he uh, restored them, how he, uh, uh, you know, helped them. And then he, it's also a picture here that we can see of when, how we are born spiritually, you know, uh, uh, you know, previously we are like, just like this baby, you know, born, uh, nobody to care for, nobody to wash it, clean it, purify it, clothe it. Um, but, uh, you know, God looked at our pitiful, sinful state. And um, uh, and then, you know, God, you see that uh, uh, when uh, we are born spiritually, God washes away all of our filth, our sins, our dirt, and uh, he clothes us with his righteousness, uh, he clothes us with his holiness, with his purity. Uh, we are called sons and daughters. We are not left as orphans. Uh, and we see that we are cleansed of all our sins. So here, this is what it means about washing and not referring to baptism. The regeneration actually refers to new birth. Regeneration is, you know, a uh, becoming new so it's new birth or it's talking about when we are born again so when god saves us he raises us up from spiritual death to life uh, the new birth is god's doing and uh, it is according to his will and then uh, paul says that we are also renewed by the holy spirit so you know once we are born again god washes us of all our sins but inwardly, we are being renewed uh, once we are regenerated, once we are born again, once we are made a new creation. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, there's a renewal that is happening of our mind. And it's something that this ongoing process that takes place, uh, you know, every moment, um, uh, you know, after we are born again, it takes place after we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, our minds are being renewed. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, uh, Paul talks about uh, putting on the new man, uh, which is being renewed in the image of the one who created us. So while God created us in our new nature, uh, and this is done by the power of the Holy Spirit, we must walk in the Spirit, uh, which means we need to be transformed and renewed in our minds, in our emotions, in our will. Uh, because when we are born again, we are born again only in our spirit man, but our minds and our bodies are the same old minds and bodies, and we need to be transformed and renewed. And this renewal pr process is something that is ongoing, that is happening every moment uh, and every day. And how, are we be how can we be renewed? in our minds and in our bodies? How can we be renewed in our minds and our bodies? Yes, by the word, reading God's word. Thank you, Erin. 
reading the Bible. What else renews our minds and our wills and our emotions? Not only just reading the Word of God, but also also prayer, fellowship with other believers, praise and worshipping God. So all of these um, are ways that we can be renewed uh, in our uh, minds and in our bodies and in our spirit. Okay, And verse 6, he says, whom he poured out on us abundantly through uh, Jesus Christ. Abundantly means richly. So God has poured out the Holy Spirit upon each one of us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we have not received small portions, but God has poured out the Spirit uh, without any measure. The Bible says that, uh, you know, Jesus had the Spirit without measure. We can all, we also have the Spirit without measure. The Spirit on us uh, is poured out richly uh, through Jesus Christ. So we see that all three people of the Trinity are involved in this wonderful gift of uh, salvation that we have received from God. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all three persons of the Trinity involved in the work of salvation and in us receiving the wonderful gift of um, salvation. Okay. Uh, verse 7, he talks about, uh, you know, having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay, so uh, to be justified uh, means that we are declared uh, not as sinners, but declared as righteous before God. Okay, we'll pause here. It's time for our break. Uh, we'll take a break and come back and then we'll continue with... Um, verse uh, 7. <laughs> 